Lord, we're here again. We're here for another session, Lord, and we don't want it to be academic, Lord. We want to somehow get some revelation, some food. Lord, please help us. Lord, if your Holy Ghost doesn't quicken what I say, Lord, it'll be dead. And instead of putting Jesus in people, it'll take Jesus out because the dead letter kills. Lord, when a man speaks, it's not neutral. It gives life or it kills. And Lord, we're desperate that we have life and not death. So Holy Ghost, convict us of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Do the work, Lord, that only the Holy Ghost can do. Take the words, Lord, the dead words of the preacher and make them the living words of Almighty God. For your name's sake, amen. It's our only hope, isn't it? I can only give dead words, but the Holy Ghost can give them life and light them up to you. All right, so we're reading chapter 12, aren't we? We've looked at the woman. We said the woman's Israel, but not just historical Israel, just not circumcised Jews, the Israel of God. And I've claimed that the, the baby that's born is the bride of Christ, and it's snatched up to heaven as soon as it's born. You'll need to go back to the other studies and read the book. But when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, he was not talking about salvation. I know we use it, we've been born again, we've been born again. But really you're in the womb. You know, a baby in the womb isn't a fetus, it's a child. Is that right? A woman was with child. When you've got a baby in the womb, when it's born, it's nine months old. Because a human life starts at conception. Biologically, that's when a human life starts at conception and it's a child. But it's in the womb and its life comes from the mother. It's not got independent life. But when it's born, the cord's cut and it's now independent. Is that right? We're now in the womb. You are the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what you'll be like. My wife's pregnant, eight and a half months. I wonder what the baby will be like. May not be like me, it may look like his mum. May look like the granddad. God forbid it could look like the milkman. You don't know. I'm serious, you don't know, do you? I make love to my wife and thank God nobody else does as far as I know, but we know that these things happen, don't we? If my wife has a black baby, I'll know it's not mine. There's no genes to come out there. Do you understand? So we are the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we'll be like. Jesus said, what's born of the flesh is flesh. See your flesh, is that right? What's born of the spirit is spirit. You're not spirit yet, you're still flesh and blood. Is that right? You have the spirit in you, and you're the son of God, but you, it doesn't appear what you'll be like because there's got, there got to be a metamorphosis, hasn't it? You've got to change from mortal to immortal. You've got to be born of the spirit to be spirit. Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom. Unless you get the new body, you'll not be in the kingdom. He said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, unless you become have a spiritual body, you can't enter the kingdom. Is that right? Because flesh and blood can't enter the kingdom. So you need to be born again. You've not been born again yet. You're saved. And if you want to use the term born again, that's all right. Let's not argue about church. But Jesus wasn't talking about salvation. He was talking about the resurrection when you get the new body and you're born of the spirit. Because when you're born of the flesh, you are flesh. When you're born of the spirit, you are spirit. Well, I'm not a spirit man yet. I've got the spirit in me, I've got the Holy Ghost, but I haven't got the spiritual body. And neither of you, you can't walk through walls like Jesus. You can't think and be in London, can you? You've got to get a jolly old rotten flight. I don't like the long haul flights, but you've got to do it. When you've got the spiritual body, you can manifest. And so when the baby is born, this baby that's born is not a natural baby. Out of the whore, out of the church, comes the bride. And it's snatched away. As soon as it's born again, as soon as you get the new body, you're off. Is that right? In a twinkling of an eye, you're caught up. As soon as you get the new body, you're caught up. 
And she brought forth the man child who was to rule all nations with the rod of hand. And the child was caught up to God on his throne. And then the persecution of the woman started. And verse 7 carries on. It's not a new paragraph. It's not a new chapter. It's the next verse. In the context of the woman giving birth to the baby, the next verse says there was a war in heaven. That must be the next thing that happens. Forget your theology. Just read your Bible. The bride goes up and there's a war in heaven. Well, there's three interpretations to the war in heaven, but only one is right. I'll tell you the right one. I'm confident if you disagree, that's great. Some people say the war in heaven happened before creation. That's how the devil became the devil. He was beautiful and he was perfect. There's only one scripture they get it from, and it's a, a prophecy about the king of Tyrus. That was beauty. There was, it might be Satan, it might not. We don't, it's speculation. You can't make a doctrine out of one scripture. You've got to have more than one scripture, and you've got to have the whole Bible to prove it. But anyway, they say there was a what God made the earth perfect, and Satan was in heaven who was perfect, and who rebelled against God. The Bible never says that Satan rebelled against God. Show me the scripture. It doesn't say it. It says there was a war in heaven and it was cast out. But it doesn't say Satan rebelled against God. But this is the theory. He rebelled against God. He was cast out to the earth. Some people believe in the gap theory and that's when the earth was without form and void. And the seven days is the recreation, not the creation. That's what, you know... But the, the point is they believe that Satan sinned before creation and was cast down to earth and they, sub they substantiate it with this scripture, there was a war in heaven. Michael had fought with his angels against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceived the whole world. He was cast down to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Some people believe that Satan was cast out, not then, but when Jesus rose from the dead and he was cast out to get it nearer. I don't believe it's happened yet. And I think I'm right. Well, every preacher does. You don't have to agree with me. Let me try and reason with you. What does Revelation say? Let's read the beginning of it. The letters to the churches... And after he's talking to the church, now, when did he talk to the church? AD 70, is that right? John was on the Isle of Patmos. This is literal now. This is in time, is that right? This is not eternity. John was on the Isle of Patmos in AD 70, and he saw a vision, and the angel says, tell the churches, that was the present-day churches in Pergamos. You're not in Pergamos, are you? In Thyatira, you don't live in Thyatira. So he said, tell the churches that are in Asia. And I, I mustn't get carried away with that, why it was that in Asia, but letters to the churches, for that was for then. Now, I believe it's also chronological, and we're in the last church age now, church age, Laodicea, I accept all that. But it was for the churches then, wasn't it? <laughs> The prophecy is always for now as well as the future. So he was telling the churches then. That's in time. That's literally in AD 70. What happens after that? After this, verse four, uh, 1, chapter 4 now. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the voice which I heard that was a trumpet, that's Christ, isn't it? Hold the candlestick, the voice that thundered. And the voice said, come up hither. He's been on earth up to now, is that right? He has a vision on earth about the seven churches. And the churches are on earth. And then the voice says, come up. Why did he leave earth? Come up and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. That's the present, warn the churches. Now come up to heaven and I'll show you the future. Am I making that up? Is that, am I making it plain what it says there? I'm not adding anything to take it away. So now he goes up to heaven and he says, I'll show you things 
in the future. So there's nothing in Revelation after chapter 4 that's history. Does that make sense? If he's showing him the future, what's he talking about history for? And if the war in heaven is history, it's the only verse in the whole of Revelation that's history. You won't find any more that's history. You'll say it's all the future, won't you? So it's bad exegesis, isn't it? To say that, that one verse of the war in heaven is pre-creation, when the whole of Revelation except that verse is the future, and there's the scripture, I'll show you things which must happen in the future. So I'm not a theologian. And if you are, get rid of your theology and read the Bible. Because that's the real theology, isn't it? I'm not against theology, but I'm not, we don't want the traditions and doctrines of the church and men. Let's read the Bible. And if my interpretation's wrong, come and tell me. But don't tell me your history and your doctrinal bias. Just show me the scriptures. And I'll, I'll accept the scriptures. So I believe all revelation after chapter 4 is the future. Well, when Jesus went to heaven, if Satan was cast out, that was the future, so that, that fits in that criteria. But what it says is, he was cast out to the earth, and his place was found no more in heaven. Verse 8, he prevailed not. It doesn't say that the devil rebelled and fought Michael. He said there was a war in heaven instigated by God and Michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels and threw him out of heaven. That's really what it's saying. There's no battle of good against evil. God's in complete charge. And God said, it's time to cast Satan out of heaven. Michael, go and do it. And he went and there was a war and he cast Satan out of heaven. It doesn't say that Satan rebelled and tried to take over heaven anywhere in your Bible. Never says it. All right, I know you've been told all these things that, that he tried to take over heaven, but show me the scriptures, I'm challenging you. What it said, there was a war in heaven and Michael fought against the devil, not the devil fought against Michael. Michael fought against the devil and cast him out of heaven. It's time God said he has to be cast down and the accuser of the brethren was cast out of, and his place was found no more. My second point, that it can't have been pre-creation, because in the book of Job, there's Satan in heaven talking to God. The sons of man, God, presented themselves before God. And Satan also came to present himself before God. And God says, hiya Satan, how are you doing? Where have you been? If you know Job, this is what he says. I'm just bringing the language up today. I'm not being uh, flippant. How are you doing, Satan? Where have you been? He said, well doing my job, what you created me for. I've been going to old throw on the earth, seeing whom I can devour, I've been doing my job. And God provokes him and said, I hope you saw Job while you was down there. He loves me and hates your guts. And he says, no wonder you put a fence round him. Well, you know the story. And then another time came and Satan presented himself. So Satan's got no problem to have access to heaven in the Old Testament, is that right? Well, there was another time, you look blank, there was another time with Ahab. God wanted Ahab to fall in battle. He says, what shall we do? And one spirit said this, and one spirit said that, and one spirit said, I know, I'll go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. What do you think about that? That's terrible. God said, it's a good idea, whatever you think. God says, that's a good idea, that'll work. Is that what God said? Read your Bibles. God said, that will, that's good, that will prevail. That'll prevail, that'll work. And God gave permission for this lying spirit to go in the mouth of the prophets, so they prophesied falsely, so Ahab would fall in battle. So these spirits have access to heaven, don't they, at that time? They've not all been cast out. Because I don't think it was a good angel, do you? That was a lying spirit. It falls on the side of being a bad one, does it to you? But certainly Satan himself had access to heaven. And it's the accuser of the brethren. Is he not? And I believe he's still the accuser of the brethren, but not you. When Christ died, Satan cannot accuse you to God anymore, is that right? But he's not cast out of heaven because he can still accuse Israel. 
he can still accuse Israel because they haven't repented. The blood of Christ doesn't cover Israel, it covers us who accept Jesus. But they've, they're under slumber, they're asleep. They're waiting for the day of atonement, aren't they? Next conference we'll talk about the, the Passover, which is the, the lamb. Jesus is our Passover lamb, is that right? That's for the whosoever, for the whole world. Whoever applied the blood would be saved from the judgment, the wrath of God, that's salvation. It gets you out of Egypt, is that right? And if a non-Israeli applied the blood, the blood, the angel would pass over. And if one of God's people didn't apply the blood, they'd come under the judgment, is that right? It's the whosoever applies the blood. That's salvation, that gets you out of Egypt. That's the Passover lamb. Jesus was our Passover lamb. Jesus is not our atonement goat. The atonement goat was for Israel for once a year for them to be redeemed. Is that right? Once a year they were forgiven. The atonement goat is not for the world, it's for Israel. Once a year for the nation to be saved. That's why Jesus will come on the day of atonement. We apply the blood. They kill the lamb. Killing the lamb doesn't atone for blood. It has to be applied. Is that right? Who applies the blood? For your salvation, you. Jesus doesn't apply the blood for you. When he went into heaven with the blood, it wasn't for you, it was for Israel. We apply the blood. Is that right? By faith, we apply the blood and we are saved. We're out of Egypt, we're God's people. But Israel, is Jesus was their atonement goat at the same sacrifice. And he's taken his own blood into the temple in heaven because now he's the high priest after Melchizedek and he's still at the right hand of God, officiated as a high priest after Melchizedek and he's still got the blood. That's what happened in the Old Testament. When the high priest came out of the temple on the day of the atonement, the whole nation was saved, is that right? How can a nation be born in the day? Easily, day of atonement. How can Israel be saved in a day? The day of atonement, when Jesus comes back to his own people, having applied the blood, they'll be saved. Don't mix up the Passover lamb and the atonement goat, will you? They're seven months apart. In the Jewish calendar, we've mixed them up. Christians don't know. The only part of the New Testament that talks about the atonement goat is the letter to the Hebrews. When Paul's talking to Gentiles, it's a Passover lamb. The Passover lamb, Jesus, our Passover lamb. When he's talking to the Hebrews, he talks about the blood of bulls and goats and the high priest going into the temple because it's for Israel. I'm nearly preaching next conference's sermon, aren't I? So I believe that if the devil can't accuse us anymore because the Passover lamb has been slain. And I'm unreprovable, I'm unrebukable, is that right? Unblameable. On your bike, Satan, you can't accuse me. I can laugh at him. All is that. Yeah, but Morris did this and Morris did that. So what? The blood of Jesus Christ covers me from all sin. Your accusations, case dismissed. Too late, Satan. You can't accuse me. But he can still accuse Israel yet. Because they haven't repented yet. How can they apply the blood? The priest hasn't come out of the temple yet, has he? But Yeshua's not come to them yet. They're waiting. The Israel's waiting for the Messiah. They're not wrong. Don't criticise them. They, wait, they miss the first Messiah. The church will miss the second Messiah. They're waiting for Messiah. They're right. He'll come and reveal himself to the Jews as the high priest and they'll be saved in a day. Isn't it wonderful? God's plan to let the Gentiles in and graft us on and then restore Israel on the very day of atonement. I'm convinced he'll come then. If the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost and Jesus was killed at Passover, what's going to happen at Tabernacles? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? And when he does that, we've got the booths, haven't we? We've got the millennium then. All fits perfectly. And I heard a loud voice in heaven, verse 10, say, Now is come salvation and strength. And the kingdom of God, now Jesus can come. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice heavens. That's when heaven rejoices. Don't forget, Jesus takes the blood to purge the temple in heaven. 
because Satan still has access to it. But when Satan's cast out, it says, heavens rejoice! The accuser of the brethren, the prosecuting solicitor, will never sit at the left hand of God. There's only Jesus on the right hand. He'll never come again to accuse you. Rejoice, heavens, you're free! He can never come up and accuse humanity before. The cross broke that ac accusation before us with the Passover lamb. And when the bride goes up, Satan's cast down and he can't accuse anymore. Rejoice, heavens. Piss of the poor old earth. Rejoice, heavens. Woe, cursed are the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. The devil's come down unto you having great anger because he knows he only has a short time. That's what he fears, being cast out of heaven. Because when the bride goes up, he comes down to earth and has no more access to heaven. He can never accuse anyone again. He's lost all his power in heaven to stand before God and accuses. He's down on the earth and he knows his damnation is very close. Well, ever the church are there and the bride doesn't come out, he's happy. He's happy with the church. He doesn't mind. If the church get the worldwide, he doesn't mind. What he fears is the bride, the remnant going up, because he'll be cast out, and he knows his time is short. He's on a, a short fuse now. He's going to be bound for a thousand years very quickly after that. And then he's only loose for a little time, and he ends up in the lake of fire. And the devil is terrified of the rapture, terrified. That's why you should look forward to the rapture and rejoice. The devil is paranoid about this baby that can be born. He's absolutely fearful. It's damnation to him, because when the bride goes up, the plan of God's finished. The mystery's going to be revealed. It said the mystery that was hidden. The mystery's revealed now. The bride's gone up. It's the end. God's got his wife, and, 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 and Jesus has got his, his bride. And Israel's restored to God. He's got, and we're going to live happily ever after. He knows the plan's coming to an end. The devil knows the plan, and he knows his time short. And he comes down to earth, and he's got great wrath. And that's when he'll persecute Israel, the woman. That's where he'll persecute her. Because he's coming down to earth. He's not accusing them in heaven. He's coming down to earth to physically try and destroy them. Is this making sense? And I believe that's when Satan personally enters the man of sin. Don't forget the seven years, isn't there, that people talk about. That's not mine. You know what most theologians talk about, the seven-year period, where the, the man of sin will break his covenant halfway through. Don't forget he's going to take over the world democratically, the man of sin, supported by the church, supported by the whore, and he's going to take over the world democratically and be a man of peace. Is that, you know your Bibles to say that. When they say peace, peace, then sudden destruction. He's not going to become as the man of lawlessness. Christians who are looking for the man of sin, the man of lawlessness to come, might fall for the man of peace as the real Messiah. He's going to come as the man of peace first and make a pact with Israel and everything will be great. But I believe after three and a half years, so as my thinking is now, and I'm open to change, and I've changed over the years, I've never been fixed. For me, the rapture will be halfway through. Because when the bride goes up, the devil comes down, according to this chronology. And that's when he enters the man of sin. And overnight, he becomes, from the man of peace, he'll become the man of lawlessness. Because he's indwelt by Satan. He'll be Satan in the flesh. And suddenly he'll turn. The world will think he's a wonderful man. Like Germany thought of Hitler. Hitler wasn't a bad man. He, he rebuilt Germany after the war, didn't he? He built the Autobahns, the Volkswagen, the people's car. Hitler was a saviour to Germany because he rebuilt Germany, if you know history. He wasn't a monster till he got fully in power and then he turned. Napoleon, all of the same, all these dictators, they get in democratically often and then they turn. And when Satan's cast out of heaven, he led to the man of sin. Just like he entered Judas. There's only two people in the Bible, I know, I've said it, that Satan enters. Judas Iscariot, who's a, a type of this man, and the man of sin, the one world dictator. And he led to him, and who will he turn to persecute? The woman. 
He's lost the baby. The bride's gone. The church has been raptured. He's mad. And he comes down and I'll, I'll destroy that woman. And he tries to pursue it. God helps her. We, we, I can't go into it all. The persecution of Israel is called Jacob's trouble in the Bible. It talks about it. Before Jesus reveals himself and comes a second time to appear to Israel, they have the worst persecution since Adam. That's terrible. I love Israel. I don't want them to have worse than they've had, do you? But it says, let's turn to Matthew 24. The disciples, who were Jews, is that right? They were Israel. They said, when's the end of the world? What's the sign of your coming at the end of the world? To the Jews, the sign of it is who was coming again. They didn't understand about the rapture, did they? At this time, Jesus hadn't died. So they weren't asking, when's the rapture? They said, when's the end of the world? When's the sign of your coming? When are you going to come and restore the kingdom to Israel? That was always what was on the disciples' minds. When will you restore the kingdom to Israel? When will it happen? When's the end of the world? When will it happen? And Matthew 24, Jesus tells them. He goes through it. There again, it's chronological, Matthew 24. You'll see this and you'll see that and you'll see that. It's not a vision. He's telling you what will happen. False prophets, verse 11, rise and deceive many. When you shall see the abomination of desolation, I believe that's when this man of sin changes, Satan comes in him, and instead of the, the temple that everyone's sending money to build for the Antichrist, that he's going to, I don't know, like Antiochus Epiphanes, put the pig in it or whatever, I don't know, but it's going to desecrate the temple, isn't it? The abomination of desolation just spoken by Daniel. Now, Jesus says that will happen. I believe that's when the, the, the Satan enters him. Then let he which is on the housetop not take anything. Let those that are in Judah flee to the mountains. This tribulation is not of the church. You're not in Judah. He said, let those that are in Judah flee to the mountains. This is in Israel. This is the, the persecution that's going to come. Verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation such was not since the beginning of the world to the time no, nor ever shall be. That's Jacob's trouble. Let's read it in Jeremiah. Jeremiah's talking not to the church, but to Israel. Is that right? The church has stolen Jeremiah and Isaiah, and so it's to us they spiritualize all Isaiah. Isaiah's nothing to do with us, it's Israel. Well, we, we, that's your roots. If you want to know the history of the church, look in Revelation. But the history and the future of Israel is all in Isaiah. That's why there's 66 chapters in Isaiah. One for every book of the Bible. There's 66 books in the Bible. It's everything about Israel in Isaiah, and it tells them the future. Don't read it as though it's for the church. Don't spiritual Isaiah. Spiritualize Isaiah. It's talking about Israel and what will happen, literally. Where are we? Um, Jeremiah, aren't we? Jeremiah 20. 30. Jeremiah 30. Right, verse 5. All right, you'll have to check that I'm reading in context. But verse 1 says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, write all these words that I've spoken to thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah. That's pretty specific, the two kingdoms, isn't it? That's not the church, is it? And I will cause them to return to the land that I give their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and Judah. For thus saith the Lord... So going back to the land isn't so wonderful, is it? Do you think Satan's worried about Israel going back to Israel and getting the land back? He's happy. Satan's happy if all the Jews of the world, he'd like them all to go today back to Israel because he's got them all in one place. He can annihilate, annihilate them all together. Think from the devil's perspective. We know what God's going to do and deliver Israel. But imagine you're Satan. Wouldn't you be glad 
if every Jew went back to Israel, you can annihilate them in one go. You don't have to get the Jews in New York and the Jews in Russia and the Jews in Poland, do you? They're all back in Israel, wonderful. Do you think the devil's worried about that? And he's saying, thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling. He's just said they're all going back to Israel, wonderful, but what for? God's also gathering them to plead with them, to chastise them, to put them under judgment so he could, they'll repent. Is that right? How did God get the 12 brothers of Joseph to repent? He caused a famine, distress, they're going to die. And they had to go back to Egypt so Joseph could plead with them. Jesus is Joseph in type, isn't he? Joseph is Jesus, sorry, in type. And the look on him who they pierced, and Jesus will say, you meant it for bad when you killed me, but God meant it for good. I'm now able, because you killed me, because you killed me, I'm able to save you, because. Not in spite of, because. Because you shed the blood that needed to be shed. You killed the Passover goat. And now I'm the high priest, so I can actually sprinkle the blood, which I've done to my father, and now I can come out of the temple and say, you're all forgiven. Isn't it wonderful? Read Joseph again, it's Jesus. With the 12 tribes, why do you think Joseph had 12 brothers? Why didn't he have three? Or 2.4 to be politically correct. Why did he have, why were the 12 sons? The 12 tribes, it's all Israel, isn't it? We have heard a voice of trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with a child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? Every man is in pain like a woman. I'm not a woman, but I've heard them scream in hospital. I've heard them scream out in hospital of the pain. And every man's like that holding his bowels, screaming out like a woman in travail. And all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Because when the birth pains are there, it's time for the birth. Israel will be born again. Israel will be born in a day after the pain. So it's wonderful them going back to Israel, rejoice, but actually it's going to cost them because God's got to plead with them and chastise them. I don't believe healing's in the atonement, but I believe in healing, but you don't need blood for healing. The disciples healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils, and Jesus hadn't shed his blood. Isaiah raised the, uh, Elijah raised the dead without the blood. You don't need the blood for healing. In the Old Testament, when you were sick, you never killed an animal. You never shed blood to be healed. Healing was to do with obedience or disobedience. Check your Bible. I believe 100% in healing. Raising the dead, casting out devils. You don't need the blood for it. They cast out devils, heal the sick, and raise the dead before Jesus shed his blood. He sent them out. Jacob's trouble. The church don't know anything about this, do they? Do you know what the church scenario is of the last days? They think they'll take over the world. They'll Christianise finances, politicians. We'll Christianise and redeem the arts. Is this what they're saying? The devil's got it. We need to redeem culture. We need to redeem the arts. They're, they're going to take over the world. And they will. The church will take over the world. We'll get the one world church. Don't be part of it. Be part of the bride that comes out. Let's get the dominion of the earth back that he gave to Adam. He told Adam to have dominion. The devil took it away. We've got to get it back. The funny thing is the Bible never says we've got to get it back. That's nice speculation. Tell me where it says redeem politics, redeem music, redeem the arts. Where does it say it? It doesn't. In fact, it said the opposite. Hate the world. If you love God, you'll hate the world. Salt in society is blasphemy. It says you're the salt of the earth. The earth is terra firma, it's physical. It's the light in the world. Society is the world. It doesn't say be salt in society. It said be light in the world. That's a battle. That's a confrontation. You can't mix light and darkness. You can't permeate darkness with light. 
As soon as you bring light, darkness goes at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. That's how fast darkness goes when light comes. But we say let's permeate, let's be like salt permeating society. We've mixed the metaphors. Salt of the earth, creation, and light of society. But we've mixed it, let's be salt in society and cross them. Church do it all the time, mix the metaphors and get what they want. Friendship evangelism, is, uh, friendship evangelism, it's all nonsense. Jesus said, I've come to bring a sword. Truth hurts. You can't be a friend with lies, can you? You have to tell the truth. God's people never learn from history, do they? Ezekiel 13, verse 4, first. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. The Lord saith that the Lord has sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Patting each other on the back, this mighty man of God. Verse 10. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was no peace. We're going to take over the world, and then we can welcome his majesty. All these songs that you sing, majesty, worship his majesty, they're good songs, I can sing them. But they're singing it because they think they're going to bring the kingdom in. Graham Kendrick write it, let's bring the kingdom in. You can't bring the kingdom in. Jesus has gone away to prepare a kingdom and he'll come back with his kingdom. The church cannot bring the kingdom in. You have the kingdom within you, but how can you bring the kingdom in without the king? You can't have a kingdom without the king. And Jesus is not king yet, he's high priest. He's not king yet, is he? He's going to be physical king of Israel, sat on the throne of his father, David, literal. Well, he's not there yet, so how can we bring the kingdom in? Jesus will bring the kingdom with him. And you can be part of it, if you'll suffer a bit. Let me, let me go to part three. There's lots I could say, you realise it, I mean, there's a lot in Revelation, isn't there? And I, there's lots I don't know. But part three is just about this first resurrection. So if you believe, if you come along with it, me, and you believe that the bride will come out of the church, which, which is Babylon, really, the whore, because we brought politics in, we brought voting. What church do you know that doesn't have voting? That's politics. If you bring voting in your church, it's Babylon. Isn't the Holy Ghost supposed to pick the deacons? If you fast and pray, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I've called them to do. The Holy Ghost chooses people. So who qualifies to be the bride? Good question, isn't it? Are all the church the bride? Well, they can't be. Can all the church reign with Christ? There's a billion Christians in the world, isn't there? Can a billion reign? Can you have a billion in the government? If they're going to reign, we've got, you need a billion people to look after the world. It's not reasonable, is it? That's who live at the moment, a billion. What about all those who were saved from 2,000 years ago? Are they all going to reign with Jesus? It doesn't make sense. You can't have all chiefs and no Indians, can you? Can't have all bosses and no workers. I'm just giving you a bit of time to think. Who qualify? Do we know? Is it speculation? You need to know, don't you? Well, the Bible talks about it. Let's, let, there's loads and loads of scriptures. Jesus and the apostles show that some qualify to reign and some don't. We're talking about the kingdom. Everyone who's accepted the Passover lamb, salvation, are saved. Is that right? Whatever sort of a life you lead, if you live a selfish life, do you lose your salvation? If you're a proud person, do you lose your salvation? I hope not. I know a lot of crowd, proud Christians, including ministers. You don't lose your salvation by how you live, otherwise it's by works. 
If I have to live a good life to be saved, none of us will be saved. You can't live a good life before you're saved, and you can't live a good life after a sinless life, can you? So it's not be works, it has to be by grace. That's for salvation. That's because your name's in the book. And unless you're blotted out of the book, which would be very difficult, once the name's written in, God wouldn't blot your name out lightly. Some people believe it could never be blotted out. But whether you do or not, if your name's in the book, you're saved. But that's salvation. There's a thousand years of reign of Christ before the great white throne. Who's going to qualify to reign with Jesus? Qualification for reigning is works, not grace. The church have deceived us. It's all by grace. Yes, salvation is by grace. You can't work. Reigning with Christ is not by grace, it's by works. Because there's qualifications. And I'm going to read you a few, so just see what you think. Romans 8, let's look at the scriptures. Now, if you don't accept what I've said, that there's qualifications after these scriptures, you've got a mental block, or you won't listen to logic, which means you're stupid. <laughs> Is that right? If somebody says something logical and you don't believe it, you've got a problem, haven't you? You believe in fantasy. If it's plain, if it says it, if you measure me and I'm five foot, two and a half in my stocking soles, and somebody tells you I'm six feet, and you've measured it and see five foot two and a half, you're a fool to think I'm six foot, aren't you? I'd like you all to think it, but it's a lie. So I'm going to play some facts to show that some qualify and some don't. And there's loads more. All right, let's, in, let's get into it. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. All right, the context. Verse 15, we've not received the spirit of bondage, but receive the spirit of adoption. We've been adopted. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. Why? Because Jesus' Father has accepted us into his family. I'm now a child of God. Not like Jesus by birth, but by adoption. I'm a child. So Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. We've been adopted into his family. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. We're the children of God. That means you're saved. Is that right? If you're a child of God, you are saved, full stop. But he doesn't stop there. And if children, then heirs. Oh, so I can get the inheritance that a legitimate child would have. I'm not legitimate in that I'm adopted, all right. But because I've adopted into the family, I'm an heir because I'm in the family. You're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if... ah qualification if you suffer with him that you may be glorified together with him is that a qualification or not you're born again you're saved and you're an heir you'll inherit if your inheritance is an if your salvation is sure eternal life is secure never worry about your eternal life it's finished the accuser of the brethren cast down since Jesus for the church you can't be accused your salvation's sure but you may not receive the inheritance the prodigal son didn't he wasted it and when the father died he was restored back but there was nothing to show do you realise that the prodigal son the elder brother was groaning and moaning. And the father says, what's the matter? He said, well, he's wasted all his inheritance. He's spent all his inheritance. And the father said, why are you belly aching? Because all that I have is now yours. So when the father died, the elder son got his half of the inheritance and the younger son got nothing because he'd spent it. He was restored. That's why he had the fatted calf and the blessing. We think, isn't it wonderful he had the blessing and the fatted calf? Yes, but he got no inheritance. Is that right? Think about it. Because he said, all that I have is now yours. He's got no inheritance. He's forfeited his inheritance. Think about it. All the parables were for Israel, not for the church. We can spiritualise it. We can apply it. I wonder who the elder brother is. And the younger brother, think about it. Old Drew's going to moan when God restores Israel back. 
<laughs> We've been faithful for 2,000 years. They've been backslidden. They crucified Jesus. Yelp, yelp, yelp. We'll get our inheritance if we suffer him. So suffering is a qualification for inheritance. I'm not saying that. That's what Paul said in Romans. Okay. Revelation 20. All right, this is suffering again. I'm, I'm trying to use more than one scripture, all right. It's Jesus just flirting a scripture at you. I believe they're in context, but, you know, I still want to give more than one. This is the angel came down from the bottomless, having the key of the bottomless piss and bound Satan. So this is the beginning of the thousand year reign, is that right? Revelation 20. An angel comes down with the key of the bottomless piss and he binds Satan in the pit. So the bride's gone up and Jesus has come down. Israel's been restored. We're going to start the reign of a thousand years. And he laid hand on the dragon, etc. Bound him in the bottomless pit. And I saw thrones, plural, and they set them upon them. A judgment was given unto them. You'll rule the nations with a rod of iron if you repent. If you overcome... You'll rule the nations with a rod of iron. All the, all the letters to the churches are, repent or else. If you repent, you'll rule the nations with a rod of iron. You'll sit on this throne, you'll do that. Qualifications. And I saw, and I saw thrones set up, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and that not worship the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark on the foreheads, and, the hands. and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, there's some martyrs reigning. If everyone reigned, it wouldn't tell you that, would it? If all the church reigned, why would it tell you? They that suffer will reign. Why would it say those that were beheaded reigned if everyone reigns? Wouldn't make sense, would it? Just logic, deduction. But I'm not finished. You know your Sermon on the Mount. I'm, I'm, comes out of my pores. I've been preaching it 20 years. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. Why are the humble blessed? Because they're saved. No, proud people are saved as well. Proud Christians are saved as well as humble Christians. But you're blessed if you're humble. Why? Yours is the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. Jesus didn't preach salvation be grace. He preached the kingdom. Everywhere he went, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. The Acts of the Apostles. Paul, he went and he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus is coming again. That's the message of the church. All right. Of course you need saving, but that's the message of the church. Jesus is coming again. He's coming to set the kingdom up. He's coming to restore Israel. Of course, if we think we're spiritual Israel and we're the kingdom, you don't preach it. You preach kingdom now. We're the kingdom. Let's, let's reign. Let's reign. Fancy reigning before the king comes. What blasphemy. Fancy the church thinking they can reign. What a mess they've made of it. Trying to get authority and power in this world. Courting politicians. Bringing anything in to build the kingdom. Bringing entertainment in and anything to please the people to get the money and build the kingdom. Blasphemy. Terrible. The whore. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek. Meek means teachable. So you lose your salvation if you're not teachable? Of course not, you're saved. But you're blessed if you're teachable, why? You'll inherit eternal life? No, the earth. He says the meek will inherit the earth. That's, terrible. That's physical earth, isn't it? He didn't say you'll go to heaven, you'll have eternal life. He said the meek will inherit the earth. We don't read it, do we? Who will inherit the earth so the, the meek will go to heaven? nothing to do with salvation. The Beatitudes are not to do with salvation. He's talking to people who are saved. But he said, you're blessed if you're meek. You'll inherit the earth, you'll reign with me. If you're humble, you'll see the kingdom. Unless you humble yourself as a child, you won't even see the kingdom. You'll sleep for a thousand years and get resurrected at the second resurrection to face God. And your name's in the book. Great. But you'll miss the marriage feast, you'll, you won't be the bride, you won't reign. That's why Paul says, I'm running the race as though only I'm going to win it. Why would a Christian do that? Because he wanted to be the bride of Christ. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. 
Everyone who says Lord, Lord is saved by faith. The witches don't say Lord, Lord, do they? Islam doesn't say Lord, Lord to Jesus. He's talking about Jesus, everyone who says Lord, because he says I. So he's talking about everyone who calls Jesus Lord. You can't call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Says it, doesn't it? 1 Corinthians, you know it, 12. Nobody can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. So they've had revelation of the Holy Ghost. These are people who say, not everyone who says Lord, Lord, in other words, knows Jesus has eternal life, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Didn't say they wanted to return all life. You need to reread your Bible. And every time it talks about the kingdom, it's not eternal life. When it's talking about salvation, it's eternal life. When it's talking about the kingdom, it's the reign of Christ, when he restores the kingdom to Israel. But you see, if you believe the church is the kingdom, you're going to miss the real kingdom. Fancy accepting the kingdom now. When you can have it in the future. Isn't that the devil's lie? Live now, pay later. God says, pay now and live later. Suffer with me now. Sacrifice to be meek, to be humble now. You'll reign with me. Do you think Jesus Christ will reign with proud, obnoxious Christians, of unteachable Christians, of Christians of pastors who bullied the flock, of pastors who raped the church for all the money they can get to drive a Rolls Royce? Do you think that man will reign with Christ? who humbled himself and let men despise him and beat him up and crucify him, do you think you're going to qualify to reign with Christ? Because you built a mega church and live like a millionaire. Do you think that's qualification? That you've won a million souls into Babylon, into the whore, that you made the whore fat? That won't qualify you. It's the meek who inherit the earth. It's the humble who see the kingdom. That was Matthew 18, 1 to 3. Except you become as a little churl, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. He said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, which I imply, unless you're in the first resurrection, unless you get the new body, you can't see the kingdom, Nicodemus. He's talking about the resurrection and the kingdom to Nicodemus. You won't enter the kingdom, Nicodemus, because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom. Did you know that most Christians will live eternity in flesh and blood? Does that sound crazy? I bet no one's ever told you that. Well, the next conference we're going to get to the end of the world where we all live happily ever after. But in the new heaven and the new earth, there's the tree of life. Is that right? What do you need the tree of life for if you've got an eternal body? The tree of life is for flesh and blood to live forever. Where was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? What was it there for? So that flesh and blood would never die. Adam did not have an eternal body. He did not have a supernatural body. Adam was made for the earth and everything that God made lives and dies. Adam would not have lived forever in his body unless he ate of the tree of life. I can prove it to you because as soon as he sinned, you'll know the scripture, God said, Unless he eats of the tree and live forever, we'll have to put him out of the garden. Because now he's sinned. If he keeps eating the tree of life, he'll live forever. So that was why he died. The day you eat it, you'll die. The day they eat it, they cut him off from the tree of life and he started to die. And it took 900 years. It takes a long time when you've had the, life of, the tree of life in you. But the tree of life was so Adam would live forever as flesh and blood. Is that right? Well, what's the tree of life for on the new heaven and the new earth if we've all got the spiritual bodies that can't die? You don't need the tree of life. But it doesn't only talk about New Jerusalem, which is the bride, isn't it? The city. It says the nations that are saved have access to the city and they have a right to the tree of life. They've missed the first resurrection. If you're raised in the second generation uh, resurrection to face God, you'll face him in your flesh. I believe only the first resurrection is the bride and the resurrected body. You'll live forever because you've got the tree of life. And the tree of life, what's the least for? The healing of the nations. My goodness, what do you need healing for the nations if you've all, everyone in the new heaven and the new earth has a spiritual body? Just think about it. You've read it, but you've... Ne you've isn't it funny we read it, but don't read it? 
What's the leaves of the tree healing for the nations? What's the tree of life for if you've all got a supernatural body that doesn't die? Jesus rose with a resurrection body. Jesus never sinned, but he would have died. He was getting older. He was a boy and he got to be 30. Jesus wouldn't still be alive today, you know. Because you don't sin, don't, it doesn't mean you live forever. You're flesh and blood. Jesus was flesh and blood. They killed him. But when he rose from the dead, he had a, a spiritual body, an eternal body. And flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom. You can't reign with Christ in flesh and blood. When you're on the earth as the bride, you've got to get the new body. If you're dead, you'll sleep till after the thousand years. Blessed are those who are in the first resurrection. Over them the second death hath no power. But those who had lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And the rest of the dead rise not again till after the thousand years. All right, I'm quoting scripture out of time now. So you'll either live in the millennium and you're saved, but you've missed the rapture. You've missed it. And you're saved. And you might die in the millennium and then you'll be raised to face God and your name's in the book. But I don't believe all Christians are the bride of Christ. And because of that in Revelation, I can't believe that everyone will get the new spiritual body. Think about it. Don't just accept it because I said it. Don't think, oh, Morris is always right. I hope I am. I hope I've done my homework. I hope I'm... But, but don't accept it. Go away. Ask God. Read the Bible. Read that revelation about the nations that are saved. Who are they? That's not the lake of fire. There's the bride, New Jerusalem. There's the nations that are saved who have access to it. Like I said, they think they're going to walk on the streets of gold. They are. I want to be the gold. The bride is the gold. The bride is the silver, the precious stones. But the pearls, the entrance into the city is through suffering. A pearl is the only precious thing that's formed through suffering. Gold doesn't suffer, but a pearl is formed through suffering. That's the entrance into the golden city. Do you think you, if you float to heaven on a cloud of glory, you're going to get through that new Jerusalem? I want to be the city. I want to be the gold, the silver, the precious stones. The wood, hay and stubble can't be the building, can it? It's burnt up. When you're tried by fire at the judgment seat of Christ, it decides whether you're the gold, silver, precious stones, the city, or wood, hay and stubble. But wood, hay and stubble is not the lake of fire. It's your works that are burnt up, how you've lived as a Christian. Because it says your works are burnt up, but you yourself will be saved. Is that what it says? I forget, I've no time for the scripture now. Is it 1 Corinthians 3? You yourself will be saved. But you're all burnt up. There's no silver, no gold, no precious stones. You're not part of the city. You're not part of the bride. I mean, I brought clear scriptures about the kingdom and reigning, but surely that's applicable. Gold, silver, precious stones. Isn't that what New Jerusalem's made of? Streets of gold, gates of pearls. You know 1 Philippians 3.10, don't you? That I may know him. Why would Paul say that? That I may know him. Now, no, it is sexual union. Adam knew his wife. So it's sexual union or spiritual union, becoming one. Adam knew his wife. To know God is not to know about him. It's not to know your doctrines. It's nothing to do with church and doctrines. It's becoming one because I in you and you in me. That's intercourse, isn't it? Physical and spiritual. You become one. Like I and the Father are one, Jesus, and I in you and you in me. That we're one. That's spiritual union, spiritual intercourse. And Paul said that I may know him, become one with him. I want to be the bride. The bride will become one with Christ. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to be in the resurrection. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Why? Why do I want the fellowship of Christ's sufferings? That if any means I may obtain the resurrection. What do you mean you'll obtain the resurrection? If everyone gets it, with no price and no qualifications and no suffering, why would he say that I may obtain the resurrection if every Christian gets the resurrection? Why does Hebrews at the end talk about the people who achieve marvellous things through faith? 
Through faith they stopped the mouth of lions. Through faith they did this. Through faith they did that. Through faith they did marvellous things. And then at the end that the faith preachers leech, leave out, he says, and others refused deliverance because they were stupid. No. They refused deliverance to obtain a better resurrection. Tell me what's a better resurrection? A resurrection is you're dead and you become alive. Can you get better than that? Can you get better than a resurrection? A resurrection, you're dead and you're alive. What's a better resurrection? A better resurrection is when you're resurrected with the spiritual body instead of flesh and blood to serve, face God. He wanted a better resurrection than everyone else to obtain a better resurrection. He wanted to be in the first resurrection. Think about it. Don't accept what I'm saying without thought. But you'll have to tell me what a better resurrection is. If we're all going to get the same resurrection, why would he seek a better one? There's no such thing as a better one unless it's different. Is that right? So if every Christian is going to be resurrected, why is he saying, I want to conform to his suffering, I want to know him and be one with him so, I obtain, so they obtain a better resurrection? All right, I'm mixing those two scriptures up there. The rich young ruler qualified for salvation but missed the kingdom. Should I say that again? The rich young ruler qualified for salvation and missed the kingdom because he asked two questions, not one. I've no time now, time's running out, so check your Bible later if Jonas not got it. What did the rich young ruler say? First question, Master, what must I do to obtain eternal life? That's salvation, is it? Eternal life, to live forever, means salvation. How do I get saved? It's under the old dispensation. Jesus hadn't died. Jesus couldn't say, repent, and get washed in the blood, put your hand up and say the sinner's prayer. Jesus hadn't died, had he? So what could Jesus say? He had to talk to him under the old law. Keep the commandments by faith. Did you know you could be righteous through the law? If you kept the law by faith. It's faith that saves you. Not grace. Grace does not save you. You're saved by grace through faith. No faith, no grace. We preach cheap grace. Because faith requires action. Faith without works isn't faith. No changed life, no repentance, no faith, no grace. You're saved by grace, but it was through faith. Faith is the operative word, not grace. Grace is the consequence of having faith. Is, is this common sense? If you're saved by grace through faith, then the only way you get grace is through faith. So faith is what pleases God. You can't please God without faith. And when you please God with faith, you get grace. You can't get grace without. Otherwise, it's cheap grace. Come to God, it's all right. Oh, God loves you, it's all right. No repentance, no... Just live how you want. God just wants to shower you with indulgent blessings so you can have a carnal life. That's cheap grace. Where's the faith in that? The world would be all Christians if we promised them Rolls Royces and that like they do. No wonder the churches are full. No wonder man's got a church of 10,000. He's offering them Rolls Royces if they give to the ministry. Of course you'll fill a church. Talk about sufferings and qualifications. You'll empty the church. So what did he preach? Because you paid me wages. I've got to keep you happy, haven't I? Thank God nobody pays me. Thank God I'm not paid. I'd be a hireling. I'd be hired. Fancy your church paid a pastor hiring him. Because if they hire you, they can fire you. You're serving the church, not God. You're trapped, aren't you? Is that right? The lender, the borrower's servant to the lender. If they pay you, you've got to... He who pays the piper calls the tune. There's no point a pastor moaning that the church won't let me do what I want. You're accepting the money. If you're a hireling, you're doing it for hire. All right, is that a bit too strong? So the rich young ruler. Good job I've got my notes. I'd be off on a tangent, wouldn't I? But I've been, off, I've been off on one all the time, all right. The rich young ruler said, what thing must I do for eternal life? And Jesus told him, keep the law, keep the commandments. And he felt he quite, he said, I've done this from my youth. 
I believe he kept the law by faith. He said, I've kept all this from my youth. The trouble is he pressed button A, so he got no money back. He said, what do I lack? What can I do to have eternal life? Jesus told him, and he says, well, I've done that. In other words, I must have eternal life then, because I've kept the law. I'm righteous according to the law, I've kept it. What do I lack? That's the sin of the church. They say, but they don't say, what do I lack? Isn't it sad? They're saved, hallelujah, I'm saved. They can live any old life they want, they never say, what can I lack? I know why they don't, because Jesus will tell them. He said, what do I lack? Sell what you've got, give to the poor, follow me, and you'll have treasures in heaven, because when I come, my rewards will be with me. If you want to be in the kingdom, if you want to reign with me, sell what you've got, give to the poor and come and follow me, and he'll have treasures in heaven. And he couldn't. He could be saved, he was happy with the answer. He said, oh, I'm saved, I've kept that, I've qualified. But when he said, what do I like? Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be perfected, if you want to be the bride of Christ, there's a cost, young man. And he went away sorrowful. He couldn't pay the price to be the bride. That's what the parable's about, surely. Well, it wasn't a parable, it was true. He went away sorrowful. He couldn't pay the price. That's most Christians, they can't pay the price. They want the ticket to heaven, float to heaven on a cloud of glory. They don't want to identify with the sufferings of Christ. Well, good for you, you've got your ticket to heaven. It's by faith, it's not works. But I'm challenging you, do you want to be the bride? And if you say yes, it'll cost you. It doesn't mean you all have to be martyred. I'm not talking about that. Maybe you've got to live a sacrificial life. I don't know. I'm not Jesus, so I don't know. But I know you've got to start being meek, so you'll inherit it. I know you've got to humble yourself and not get arrogant, not be a know-it-all. Humble yourself. If you don't, you won't see the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, that's a scripture that says flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom. You can't reign with Christ unless you get the new body. Revelation 25 and 6, I've quoted these. Blessed is he that has his part in the first resurrection. Over him the sect hath not no power. I believe only a remnant will be the bride. Is my teaching consistent? I think so. Has it always been a remnant throughout history? How many came out of Egypt? How many were redeemed, came out of Egypt? That's talking about salvation. How many was the blood applied? Well, between two and a half and four million, depending how you compute it, from 600,000 armed men, women and children. So two and a half million. Let's put the lowest. How many got in the promised land? Two of the original. Two, the remnant. Israel didn't fail because two got in. God never fails. God's people seem to fail, but the remnant go through. In every apostasy, there's a remnant that go through. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two out of two and a half million that entered the promised land. The, the promised land, Canaan, is not a type of heaven. Over Jordan into Canaan's land, it sounds wonderful. It can't be eternal life because there's giants there and walled cities. How can it be heaven and eternal life? Is it not true throughout history only a remnant are saved? There's two that went through. It doesn't matter. Do you think the bride has to be big? Oh, God's coming for a glorious church, a magnificent church. What's that got to do with size? You've heard me say it in the Sermon on the Mount studies. When I want a wife, I don't look for the biggest woman in Manchester. <laughs> Goodness me, she's, she's, I've got three in one here. She's 50 stone. <laughs> I don't look for the biggest one, I look for the purest one, if I've got any sense. I look for a virgin, somebody who no man has touched. I want a woman that's pure, I want a woman for myself, I don't want a second-hand woman. All right, if God gives you a second-hand woman, brilliant, make a first class. But do you understand, you look for purity, it's not the size of the woman, it's the quality. Do you think God's worried about the size? Do you know in the spirit, two is the same as two billion in the spirit. Because a spiritual body is not contained in physical dimensions, is that right? Do you understand spiritual things? I could say, Stephen, 
I see an angel there. And Gail will say, I see three. And Paul says, I don't see any angel. We're all right. The spiritual realm is not like ours. You can see one angel and some could, one could see 20,000. We're talking about spirit. It's not contained in the laws of matter. You can go through walls. Is that right? And yet you're solid. They said it's a ghost. He said, oh no, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see me have. Jesus had flesh and bones and a real literal body. He said, give me something to eat. Ghosts don't eat. And he ate some food. He had a real literal body, but it was spiritual, not governed by the laws of matter. So the size of the church is immaterial. If the bride is two people, Christ will get his wife. If the church is two people, Christ will get his wife. The remnant will always come through. God's plan succeeded because only two that came out of Egypt went into the promised land. All the rest died in the wilderness. All the others that went in didn't come out of Egypt. They were born in the wilderness. But two did. What about Sodom? Only Lot got out, didn't he? What about Rahab? Just one out of Jericho. What about Ruth? Only one Moabites came in. What about Daniel and his three friends? All the 100,000 Jews that went into Babylon all bowed the knee except three. There's only three, so where's the others? All the other Jews, they must have bowed the knee. They've got Babylonian eyes. Well, we know they did. They came out with the Babylonian Talmud, didn't they? Still practicing it today. But Daniel didn't. And Daniel's intercession got the bride out of Babylon to build the new Jerusalem. There's only one reason for you to get out of Babylon. It's to go and build new Jerusalem, isn't it? I'm going to leave the rest. It'll be in the book. It's in book four. I think tonight we get on to the book five you've not got yet. What was John the Baptist's message? You're God's children. But bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. The Messiah's coming. Prepare for the Messiah. Is that right? Surely we've got to prepare for the return of Jesus. Bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. Let me plead with you. Get out of Babylon. I'm not saying leave your church if you go to a church. I'm talking about the system. You leave the world physically and go in a monastery or the world leaves you. Do you understand? There's no point leaving Egypt if you've got Egypt in you. It was easy. God getting Israel out of Egypt. The trouble is he couldn't get Egypt out of Israel. It's easy to say, oh, I'm leaving the system. No point leaving the system if the system's still in you. It's not to do with physical locations and buildings. Do you understand? Get out of the system. Make sure it's not gripping you. Make sure it's not part of you. I'm not telling you to do anything. That's between you and God. I'm talking about your heart. Make sure there's no Babylon in you. Mix with the bride. Mix with the bride. Mix with people who, who believe as we do. Knowing the time, it's high time to wake out of our sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not rioting and drunkenness, not in chamberings and wantonness, not in strife and heaven. But put ye on the Lord Jesus and don't make provision for the flesh to fulfil the lust thereof. Become the bride. Let me challenge you, become the bride. Don't just become the church. Because the bride's got to come out of the woman. Lord, please help us. Lord, I can see I've put too much information, Lord. I've not got through most of it, Lord, but I just pray.